welcome here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on site, on location at AAC Media Days in Arlington, Texas. I have the honor and privilege of covering the entire American Athletic Conference for now their decade anniversary from when before they had a logo and before they had a name to where we sit right now. And I am so excited for the opportunity here with Jackson Bratton, middle linebacker for the UAB Blazers to have you here on the show for the first time. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And and you and I were talking off the air about a, a lot of things that are bigger than football. Right, right. So we'll start with having Trent Dilfer, who a lot of you have seen here in our coverage of AAC Media Days and the American Athletic and UAB, that Trent is so open about who he is, why he is, who he serves. What's it like having him as a head coach? Uh, it's awesome. Um, you know, I can't even begin to put into words – how blessed we are as players, you know, to have him as kind of like a second father figure almost, um, you know, just the values and um, I guess you would say, you know, he teaches us how to serve, you know, what we're serving. I feel like every other week there's a serving opportunity that either him or someone on his staff that he's put together as is putting out there for us and giving us opportunity to serve. And, um, you know, he's a man of God and, um, you know, he tries to instill that in us. He doesn't pressure it on us, but, you know, he does try to give us his wise words, you know, about that. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're blessed to have him as a head coach. And, you know, I'm, I'm super th thankful to have had him come to UAB. You know, I'm excited for this year and I can't wait you know, to see how this year goes. What has he taught you so far that's been so lasting? Gosh, man, he's taught he's taught so much stuff, you know. But my favorite, you know, I don't know if, if this has been put out there or not, but really, um, treating women is one of his biggest. Um, I don't know how you would put it into words, but he he really he really likes to teach us and train us you know there's certainly treat women yeah you know treating women is wrong is not not right you know it's, um you know i love that about him he, he's not for treating women wrong and disrespecting yeah. women and um if you do you're gonna hear it from coach delver so i mean and i and i applaud that and i definitely respect and appreciate that you know because in the world of athletics there is there there has been kind of that like unspoken disrespect of women no that is not put out there and it's wrong yeah. and so when you hear a coach come in and say hey this is what i expect from you guys mm -hmm. this is what i expect from my team and you know we need to uphold ourselves to being classy to being gentlemen to being respectful to hear somebody come in and say totally outside of football this is my expectation of you as a human being what has that done for you as a person i mean it's it's done a lot for me you know it's kind of kept me on track of where i need to be you know growing up my mom and of course my dad he always taught me to respect my and you know that was a big part of our household growing up and um you know, when he got here, you know, it's kind of a reminder for me, but like, I, I feel like it's, it's good for people, you know, who didn't necessarily get taught that yeah. growing up or, you know, not saying that everybody doesn't get taught that, but I'm saying, you know, people that didn't have the opportunity to get taught how to treat women, you know, that's what he's there for. Like I said, he's like a second father figure to us. So, you know, he, um, I don't know. It's it's taught me a lot, and you know I love hearing his speeches every day and hearing what he has to say to us every day, and you know just teach us to be better, uh, better young man every single day. So for you, learning that on and off the field at middle linebacker, you're the mic. You are the voice of the defense. What does that position mean to you? That position of leadership, and how have you grown into the leader that you are? So um, I was telling another um, reporter this, a local reporter in Birmingham, um, he asked me kind of the same thing. And, uh, you know, I haven't been a leader since high school. And, you know, I'm doing the UAB kind of still. I've only been here a year and a half. Yeah. So I didn't know how my other teammates would react to me trying to be a leader with me being so new. Yeah. 
you know, some people can take it the wrong way. Hey, like, you know, this guy's only been here a year and a half. He doesn't have a say. So, so I try to take a different approach about it. And I just try to do everything, every action I make, I try to make it the, the right move and just lead by example. And then, you know, once I gain trust in my teammates, I feel like, you know, I have started being more vocal and encourage others. And, you know, especially my the, the linebacker room, I really try to, you know, help, help the young young boys out. And, um, you know, I, I am getting more comfortable with it. I was a little uncomfortable when Coach Delford first got here and he put me on a platoon leaderboard. And I was like, well, okay. Um, Coach Delford believes in me. And it gave me confidence, too. That's what I really liked about it. It did give me confidence. I just didn't know how to do it. And yeah. I mean, I'm still learning, you know, to this day how to do it. And, um, you know, I'm Coach Delford helps me out with that. And um, we have another person on our staff that has helped me as well. And um, But, yeah, I'm, I'm still learning every day. And I've enjoyed every single bit of it so far. And I'm eager to learn more as the season goes on. Bring me into pl platoon leaderboard and what that is, what that means. Okay, so we have – we've got 12, uh, 12 platoon teams. Okay. Each team has two leaders. Okay. One on offense and one on defense. So you got a team that has two leaders from offense and defense side of the ball. So, um, and then each team has roughly, I want to say right now it's eight or nine people per team. Okay. Maybe a number around in there. And um, so basically, trash is found left around your locker. You don't weigh in in the morning. You're late to a meeting, late to class, late to tutoring late to anything that you're told to be at or don't show up to treatment, you know, anything that you're not supposed to be doing, your yeah. team gets a, a platoon spin. Okay. So we have a, we call it a Barris wheel. It's okay. got different punishments on it. Okay. And you spin that thing, yeah. whatever it lands on, that's what you're doing for the rest of the week. For each thing that you do wrong. Right. So, okay. you know, you miss five things or people on your platoon team, Say five different people missed one thing. You've got five spins on the board. We call this one thing a soul cleanser. And basically, it, that's self-explanatory. It's the worst thing you could possibly do, <laughs> condition-wise. And if you have five spins and it lands on that five times, you've got five soul cleansers that week. So that's what that's about. It's just um, kind of like a accountability and um yeah it, it's a good thing because it scares people on the team <laughs> now i guess that's what you got to do nowadays to get people to do the right things but, yeah that's what that is what makes you do the right thing i guess if i had to put it into words i almost feel guilty because growing up you know my my mom my mom and dad both instilled that in me, you know, to always do the right thing. But, you know, my mom always harped on me. You reap what you sow. Yeah. And, you know, that that's out of the Bible. And and I've always been told that. I mean, if she's listening to this, she would probably laugh so hard because I, I, I tell her that now just to mess around with her. I'm like, Mom, you reap what you sow. But, um, you know, and I, I believe in that with all of my heart, you know, what you put in is what you're going to get out and you know how you treat other people is how you're going to get treated and, you know if you serve others you know i go to church of the highlands uh shout out to pastor chris um he um he's been really harping on serving others and i feel like a lot this summer he's been preaching on that big time and you know i've always believed in that and you know, I love to serve others, and so anyway, I kind of lost track of where I was even <laughs> going with that. But that's that's where that's where I stand with it. So, before we get into something called rapid fire here on the show, gotcha. Your faith means blank. Fill in that blank. Mm. I'm bad on questions that get thrown at me like that. <laughs> There's no wrong answer right here, I'm guessing, but no, there's no wrong answer. You know, my my faith, I mean, it it's, means my world, like basically, it's my everything, yeah. So uh, that's when I would put in the blame, it's my everything, 
Fair enough. Well, we're going to jump into rapid fire. Sure. What that does is it allows you to put me on the hot seat, me to put you on. It could be about football, it could be yeah, about literally anything. Yeah. But we, no pre plan, just questions firing off in rapid fire fashion. You get to ask me the first one. Okay. Uh, I got you. Where are you from? Syracuse, New York. Syracuse, New York. Which is how I met Ted Feely. Oh, okay. Because he was up at Syracuse. So we met over a decade ago. So yeah. Nice. Up in my nice. hometown. That's awesome. Is that your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. My question for you, Jax, let me see your hands. Who would you consider to be the biggest inspiration in your life? I don't want to make my dad jealous, but I mean, <laughs> I, I love my dad, but you know, my mom, she, she's all the time inspiring me. So she's got to be the most inspirational person in my life because she's always trying to inspire me to be a better person. So I would definitely say my mom. I mean, no doubt she, she's always trying to get me to better myself each and every day, you know. If I'm doing something wrong at 22 years old, and probably I'm 21, I'll be 22. And um, I'm still on this day. She lets me know when I'm wrong. She's going to let me know how I can fix it and how I need to fix it. And, you know, I love that about her. And that's my, that's the most inspirational person to be in my life. What's her first name? Donna. Donna. I got an aunt Donna. So <laughs> shout out to Donna. Appreciate you very much. What's your second one for me? My second most inspirational person. Oh, no, your second question. Oh, okay, okay. So my second question would be, do you hunt? Do, you? do I hunt? I have never done it, but I got a pretty good shot. I'm a good slingshot. Really? I'm a good slingshot. Yeah, for whatever reason, I'm good at moving targets. Yeah, yeah. There's something about my slingshot. I, I could do okay with it. So you're, awesome. ta so you're talking about hunting. So give me your best hunting story. Oh, gosh. I've got a few good ones. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell this one. I'm gonna tell my buddy to listen to this because this is about him. So uh, <laughs> okay, what's his name? His name's Cooper. Cooper Vincent. So shout out to Cooper. But we were um, so back in high school. You know, we love human hunting. You know, we all had curfews. So we couldn't stay out late at night. So you know, we would we get all fired up. You know, hunting early in the morning. Me and my buddies. Yeah. We would wake up. I'm talking like. Or three o'clock in the morning, go grab a biscuit from the gas station, an energy drink, and hit the road and go find somewhere to go duck hunting. And uh, so anyway, we we found this spot we wanted to go duck hunting at. It was on the river, and it was a uh, it was called Spring Creek. It's in Cortland, Alabama. And we had to walk down this creek to get the the creek finally made it to the saloon and opened up in the back of Spring Creek and. Um, that's where we were going to hunt. Yeah. And it was private land on a field, or it was walk this creek. So <laughs> we start walking the creek, and it starts getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And now we can't do this. So we're going to take our chance. We're going to go up on the private land and cut through. You know, it's not the right thing to do, but we did it. And by gosh, it, 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 it bit us in the rear end because my buddy you know we're carrying decoys our guns you know our backpacks everything you know waiters there's a, i guess there's a barbed wire fence that's up under the leaves that we couldn't see we had a flashlight so we didn't see a barbed wire fence but it, it catches my buddy that has about three dozen duck decoys on his shoulder it catches my buddy's foot you know i hear him go Oh, and then they, yeah, I look up, I show my bad flashlight on him, and he's just, you know, he's running. You know, when you try to catch your balance, you start running faster. But, yeah. You know, these decoys are flopping all over the place. He finally, he finally busted face first down the ground, and the decoy goes swinging <laughs> back around, and they have, yeah. I don't know if you've ever fished, but they have Texas rig weights on them, and so they're, I mean, yeah. it's concrete basically or steel whatever it comes and nails him right on the back of the head and he claims it knocked him out for a few seconds but i mean it was four o'clock in the morning pitch black and that was the funniest <laughs> thing i've ever seen in my life just to see him sprinting in waders i mean he looked like the michelin man <laughs> just rolling and anyway that, that's my funniest hunting story okay fair enough what's your last one for me my last one for you I got a good one for okay. you. Yeah. 
How old were you when you got saved? Oh, wow. So I've always believed in God. And we've always had a great relationship. Mm -hmm. I think the... Or how old were you when you got to know Jesus? So I would say, yeah, I would say when my grandfather's died when I was six. Mm -hmm. In 92, in the same year. I didn't hate God. I was the angriest I'd ever been with God. Probably maybe the angriest I've ever been in my life. And I had a dream. I just, so I was six when they passed and I turned seven. I had a dream at seven years old. I'm 37 now. I can remember the entire dream 30 years later. It was a daydream. I was in my parents' bedroom. I went out to the window. I looked outside. The sun was shining. I closed my eyes and I saw this yellowish white light and it was everywhere and in the top left corner there was an oval that was white where the light wasn't there Mm -hmm. and i was like why is it like that and i turned and there was a rock and the rock was rotating totally smooth on top jagged on the bottom and there was people on this rock and i look at the rock and i see this person in a wheelchair get up and he starts talking and he's talking and walking and i'm like oh my gosh that's my uncle bucky Mm -hmm. who was in world war ii because he couldn't really talk that well and speak that well as he got older and i never saw him out of a wheelchair so i'm seeing god having healed him in heaven and i see these other people there and i'm like okay one of them was like that's got to be a great aunt of mine she looked like my great aunt sue and I see them and then I see my grandfathers and it was the first time I had seen them since they had passed and they're looking right at me and they're waving and they said, we love you. And I just kept looking at them and they said, we're sorry. We couldn't say goodbye to you. And I can still feel it today. And um, then what we picture Jesus and, and God as I saw them both. And they looked at me and they said, my grandfathers looked over and then they appeared and God and Jesus were like, see, we do love you. Like, don't like, we know why you're mad, but don't be like, we, we got you. And then it went back to my grandfathers and they said, we love you again. And they blew me a kiss and then they turned and all of a sudden they went to the rock and I see this rock rotating and all these people are on it that I've determined are my ancestors and the rock stops they look up at that one opening in the light, the rock shoots up to the light. It completes that oval perfectly. It flashes a bright light and I wake up. And after that, I wasn't mad at God anymore. So that was 30 years ago. That's, I mean, it's not awesome. Your grandparents passed, but I mean, that's kind of a cool story. And and, and it's like, it's, it's, and it's funny because I've told that story so many times, but, and I'm, I'm not saying this because you're sitting here, it feels more clear and I can feel it more inside of me now than I felt in a really long time. And I think it's because you're sitting there. So thank you for that. That's awesome. There's something. Well, I'm glad I could, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I could be sitting here. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it definitely helped me to know that God always has my back. So my last one for you, Jackson if you could walk around the world with a neon sign hanging above your head, what would it flash and why? A neon sign was flashing with my head. I mean, we've done a lot of talking about Jesus on the air, so yeah. I'm going to keep it coming. Okay. Say, Jesus loves you. Jesus you loves flash you. Flash bright as they can freaking flash. <laughs> well, I like it, and I, I definitely appreciate you feeling comfortable enough to be open about your faith, about yes, your history, about your buddy's horrendous accident. <laughs> yeah, I had good times in high school now. So, I mean, I'm listening to the story, and I'm thinking barbed wire, cement. I'm, I'm feeling terrible for him, and then you say it's the funniest oh, thing I've ever it's seen. It's the funniest. I'm telling you, it's the hardest I've probably ever laughed in my life, because if you knew that boy... Yeah, okay. He's, All right. he's going to listen to this. If you knew that boy, it would make you laugh. All right. If I knew Cooper Vincent, then no, I would know. Okay. 
when so when that being said, UAB Blazers, a middle linebacker, Jackson Bratton here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora and this AAC football special. Jackson, it's the first time, but hopefully we'll get another one. Most definitely. Appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you.